The family of Covington Catholic High School student Nicholas Sandman is suing mainstream media news outlets for being filled with lying, corrupt, anti-American two-bit weasels so low they could walk under a snake with a top hat on. Although those may not be the exact words used in the legal documents. As you no doubt remember, Sandman and his fellow students were waiting for a bus at the March for Life in D.C. when they were threatened by some nasty black Hebrew Israelites shouting racist and anti-gay slurs. The situation was exacerbated by some gormless schmo who started beating a drum and chanting in young Sandman's face. Sandman tried to defuse the situation and even treated the schmo with respect. But because Sandman was wearing a Make America Great Again hat, the press went after him. CNN, where facts come first, right after anti-Trump bias, anti-Republican hate, unfounded accusations of racism against anyone who disagrees with them, and of course any unchecked story that may reflect badly on conservatives, then come the facts, not unless they've run out of time or can call people racist again. What was I saying? Oh yeah, CNN said Sandman and his friends displayed a quote, racist mob mentality, and quote, looked like they were going to lynch the loony Israelites who were simply quote, preaching about the Bible nearby. The Washington Post, where democracy dies in an atmosphere of leftist intellectual corruption so enveloping that their so-called journalists don't even realize how corrupt they are and simply sink deeper and deeper into philosophical darkness. Unfortunately, they can't fit that whole thing on their masthead, so they shorten it. Anyway, the editor of the Washington Post, B.S. Sanctimonious, issued a statement saying, quote, Sure, we twisted our stories to make Sandman seem evil, but hey, we're the MSM. That's how we roll, unquote. Legal experts say they expect Sandman to win $70 gazillion, after which the mainstream media will finally reform and do their jobs honestly. And maybe that's just a dream I had. Trigger warning, I'm Andrew Claven, and this is The Andrew Claven Show. I feel hunky-dunky, life is tickety-boo. Birds are winging, also singing, hunky dunky doo Ship-shaped, ipsy-topsy, the world is zippity-zing. It's a wonderful day, hurrah, hooray, it makes me want to sing. Oh, hurrah, hooray, oh, hooray, hurrah. You know, the internet, as you probably know, can be a pernicious form of solitude disguised as company. You think you're talking to other people, but you're really talking to yourself, or at least only to people who share all the same views as you and are simply reinforcing your prejudices. On top of that, the people you disagree with or don't like are out of sight, so that they eventually lose their humanity. You can say and think things about them you would never say or think if you were confronting them face to face. It's a recipe for shallow cruelty and hatefulness, and come to think of it, it's almost exactly like working for the Democrat media complex. Maybe that's why the lunatic who slaughtered 50 Muslim people in New Zealand and the disgraceful Democrats and journalists who are blaming those attacks on President Trump both seem to have a hard time telling the difference between reality and their fetid imaginations. We'll try and get at the reality in just a minute, but let us talk about ring security systems. I told you last week our producer, Jonathan Hay, uh, had a late-night call from a couple of folks who he didn't know, who looked a little bit the worse for wear and were trying to get into his house, but luckily he had ring, he had the doorbell, so we could talk to him right through, see what they were, see that they were trying to work their way inside the house. The minute it happened, the day after it happened, he went out and he just spent all the money he could getting as much ring equipment to protect his home from invaders because ring helps you stay connected to your home anywhere in the world. So if there's a package delivery, a surprise visitor, you'll get an alert and be able to see, hear, and speak to them right there on your phone. That's thanks to the HD video and two-way audio features on ring devices. As a listener, you have a special offer on a Ring Starter Kit available right now with a video doorbell and motion-activated floodlight cam. The Starter Kit has everything you need to start building a ring of security around your home. Just go to ring.com slash Clavin. That's ring.com slash Clavin. And I know, you know, you're thinking to yourself, should I do that? Yes, you should. And you're also thinking, how do you spell Clavin? It's K-L-A-V-A-N. Let me tell you a story I've told before, but I don't think I've told it for a long, long time, so I think people haven't heard it. Uh, when I was a young reporter for a newspaper in a small town, uh, I got a call from a funeral home to take an obit, which was pretty normal, uh, except this, in this case, the uh, obit was a young man who was 17 years old, and so my editor immediately said, you should check that out and find out how a 17-year-old ended up dead. I did, and it turned out he had hanged himself. I, I started to write up the story as a small obit, just saying that he had committed suicide. 
when I got a call from the boy's mother. And she was obviously incredibly distraught, and she begged me, begged me not to run the story. She did not want the fact that her son had committed suicide in the newspaper. So that was not a decision I was at a level to make, so I handed it off to my editor, who was one of the nicest women I've ever met and a woman I respected 100%. She was an incredibly good news lady and also just a sweet, gentle person. And I expected her to just say, yeah, of course, we won't run this story. But she did. She wouldn't, she wouldn't do that. She said, I, we, are, we are going to run the story. We have to. She was very sweet about it. She was very kind about it. But she said, it's just going to be a little obit, but it does have to include this information. <clears throat> Afterwards, she and I got into a conversation that lasted well into the night where I objected that I didn't see why in a small town we had to reveal the secret that this lady had. And she said, look, we're a newspaper. Everything that happens is a piece of information that we have to tell because it builds slowly the story of this town and of this county. As it turned out, she, as I found out uh, a couple of years later, was entirely in the right. I never felt good about it. But it turned out that they were having a spate of suicides. And each one of those suicides was part of that story. It was a little dot in the plantless painting that we were making of, that, of the story of that county. There was, in fact, a spate of teenage suicides going on of, this, of which this boy was one. So when a, a story like the one in New Zealand happens and a guy goes out and he slaughters uh, 50 people at their prayers and it's obviously very upsetting. He puts out a manifesto. He had a video cam going at the time he did it. There's this impulse on us to to push everything under the table, to not spread his his name or the manifesto. We, we think these guys are doing this for fame at some level and maybe spreading their name uh, makes them want to do it more. I don't have any problem with hiding the guy's name. I don't know if that's a really big uh, point about his name, but the character of the person and the manifesto and the things he do should remain public and the things he does should remain uh, public knowledge because it starts to build a picture of what kind of people commit crimes, what kind of philosophies they hold, and uh, and what it is that inspires them to do the things they do. And I don't think that the possibility that someone will be deterred from doing this by us hiding his manifesto is worth not knowing what this is. Because if ever, if ever we're going to get to a place where we can deal with these sorts of things and, and maybe lessen the number of attacks, it's going to be because of what we know, uh, not because of what we don't know. And so, you know, I was really, you know, I know that people were incredibly upset because he put this video of the killings up there and uh, people wanted to take it down. But I objected uh, to the fact that the prime minister of New Zealand uh, told Google, Instagram, and Facebook uh, that the videos had to be removed or she would uh, bring the law against them. I think that's wrong. I think there's a reason we have free speech. And even though these things are incredibly damaging and upsetting, and even though some sicko might use them as a form of murder porn, I think that they should remain uh, available to those people who, who want to look at them and study them and find out about them. However, having said all that, having said all that, the information, information like this is sensitive information it's hard information to understand. It's only a point in the pointless picture that we're drawing of why people do this stuff, and it has to be handled properly. When guys set, put out these manifestos, the instantaneous rush to claim that somehow they have condemned your political opponent uh, is is awful. It's disgusting. It's degrading to the person doing it, and it's uh, it's. It's degrading to the victims. It's using the bodies of the victims as your soapbox to make a political point. Now, when people do it on Twitter, that's one thing because people on Twitter are what they are. You know, I mean, there's, everybody's on Twitter, so you're going to get bad folks on Twitter as well as good folks. When the news media does it, it truly, truly is horrible. It truly is horrible. And that is what they are doing. I mean, I read this manifesto. Look, if, if an idea is bad, if an idea is bad, one person adopting that idea, a sick person killing people in the name of that idea, is not the proof that that idea is bad. It, you know, people have murdered each other over love. Is love bad? No. It's obviously the sickness or the passion or whatever was going on at that moment that causes this to happen. Because people murder in the name of a political idea does not necessarily... Uh, speak against that political idea. The fact that communism murdered 100 million people, that does. Then you have enough information. This is just one piece of point on a graph. It's when you have the whole graph that you have the information. The idea that you can seize on anything these guys say as proof uh, that that somehow because of the guy who uh, shot the Republicans at the, on the softball field because he was a Bernie bro, does that make Bernie Sanders in, inherently a dangerous guy? No, I don't think it does. I have all kinds of arguments against 
his philosophy, but one is not that somebody was a lunatic and did this, nor does what this guy say necessarily condemn anything that uh, he, was, he was trying to represent. I read his manifesto, uh, The Great Replacement, it was called, because he is objecting to the fact that uh, immigrants of color, and it wasn't necessarily Islam, he didn't sound too friendly to Jews or anybody else. He said he believed in white people, and he defined pe- white people as people of European descent, and that uh, people of color were moving in. He was from Australia, I believe, but he, he went to New Zealand to carry out this crime, and they were moving in to the white people's territory. The thing that struck me about these manifestos, usually I can't read the manifestos because sick people uh, are, are boring. They're repetitive, you know. Uh, they don't have anything new to say. They're, um, they're lunatics. They're not seeing reality properly. But so that it doesn't really, it's not really enlightening when they talk about what they believe. But this guy was a little bit different. This guy uh, had a sense of humor and he was very, very clearly internet savvy in a very big way. And I'll talk about that in just a second, but let me talk about a new sponsor that I really love, OpenFit. Uh, this is a, uh, a workout uh, place where you can go and get all kinds of different workouts. I was just testing it out. Uh, it's bringing something new that makes an even easier to never miss a workout. And you know, I mean, I know when I'm talking, sometimes you get so distracted because I'm just so, it's such great shape. You're sitting there going, how does he do it? Do it. And I do it because I work out constantly and I work out hard and open fit has amazing trainers and classes. They're led by some of the most effective and engaging trainers in the world. It's really simple. You can forget all the complexity and stress around getting fit and just press play and work out on your schedule. My favorite thing that they have is this thing called 600 seconds. I had my wife do the math. That's 10 minutes. 10 minutes is sometimes about what I have to work out. These guys have a workout, a 10-minute workout that will, I promise you, uh, get you out of breath and get you in shape. Uh, you can see the results. You can lose up to 15 pounds in just the first 30 days. And Open Fit has changed the way. Uh, it'll change the way you work out. And with my code, Clavin, you can join me on a fitness journey personalized just for you. Again, use my code, Clavin, and start using Open Fit for your journey to a healthier life. Right now, during the Open Fit 30-Day Challenge, my listeners get a special extended 30-day free trial membership to Open Fit, where you can lose up to 15 pounds in 30 days. When you text Clavin to 303030, 30, 30, 30, you'll get full access to Open Fit, all the workouts and nutrition information, totally free. Again, just text Clavin to 303030, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30. And, uh, you know, it's, it'll just solve the problem of how you spell Clavin. You'll be in such great shape. You'll just know it's K-L-A-V-A-N. So the thing that struck me about this is that he he put this thing out in the form of an interview. So he said that he wasn't doing committing these murders to become famous, but the fact that he put it out in the form of an interview showed that in his mind he was speaking to the public. His manifesto was in the form of an interview, so he was obviously having this daydream about explaining himself to the greater public. And the, the reason I say he was internet savvy is there was a lot of like internet trickery. You know how uh, there's a lot of trolling and secret info and all this stuff. Uh, he he did something I can't really uh, say on the air what it's called, but it's where you put up a lot of information that's supposed to throw people off. You know, it's supposed to confuse people. He said repeatedly, and this part of it I actually believe, I think he was direct, that he was trying to start hostilities between left and right. He wanted there to be hostilities, uh, kind of like Charles Manson uh, did. He wanted Charles Manson wanted to start a race war. I think this guy wanted to start uh, some kind of race war too because he was hoping that whites would rise up uh, against people of color. But, you know, he had this thing where he said something like, uh, the person who has influ- influenced me above all was Candace Owens. Each time she spoke, I was stunned by her insights and her own views helped push me further. Uh, though I will have to disavow some of her beliefs, the extreme actions she calls for are too much, even for my taste. I, I, obviously, the guy is trolling, uh, not, not Candace. He's trolling the left-wing media. He wants the left-wing media to go after Candace, which some of them did, because he knows how stupid they are and he knows they'll jump on anything. One question later, he says, Spyro the Dragon 3, this kid's video game, Spyro the Dragon 3 taught me ethno-nationalism. So in other words, he's just he's just throwing stuff out there, hoping to confuse people and hoping to cause hostilities because he knows how bad the press is. Uh, he had this thing where he says, uh, I graduated top of my class and then Navy sales and I have over 300 confirmed kills. And they call this on the internet something like copypasta, uh, Navy SEAL copypasta, where you pretend how tough you are and you try and be... Uh, 
uh, you know, you're trying to show yourself to be a, a, an important, tough guy. So he was doing all this internet stuff, which speaks to me of the fact that he's on the internet, that he's talking to people who agree with him, that he's stuck in this kind of uh, place where you get in on the internet, or if you work for the mainstream media and you're only talking to people you agree with, and you're not seeing the people you disagree with. They're uh, an abstract, they're an illusion. It doesn't matter if you say, say mean things about them. I see this on the right a little bit. They theorize about how certain people should be uh, left out of society or how certain people should be rejected because they don't know the people that they're talking about. When they see them face to face, they think, well, maybe I should modify that statement. But this guy obviously was well and truly planted in the internet only with his own people. And ultimately, the guy is a fascist. I think that was the one thing we can say. He was an ethno-fascist. He he believed in uh, fascism and um, and in maintaining the whiteness of the West. One of the things he did was he put up this thing, the question he has is, were or are you a supporter of Donald Trump? And he says, as a symbol of renewed white identity and common purpose, sure. As a policymaker and leader, dear God, no. So in other words, he doesn't like the policies of Donald Trump, but he liked the image of Donald Trump uh, as a symbol of renewed white identity. And the media and the Democrats, but I repeat myself, jumped after this and went and just went after Trump as if this had something to do with him, which I just found. I mean, this is the president of the United States that you're blaming for a lunatic shooting people in New Zealand. I mean, that is truly disgusting. Here is a montage we put together. Uh, what's his name? Jim, look at me. I'm Jim Acosta, uh, Max Boot, and Kirsten Powers uh, pulling this, um, this, making this connection. The language uh, in this manifesto that was describing the president as, as sort of a hero to people who uh, identify with the, their white heritage. Uh, and what was also striking, Anderson, in that manifesto was that uh, the killer was using terms like invaders and invasion uh, when talking about immigration and the immigration issue. Almost the same kind of language that the president was using earlier today when he was vetoing that legislation up on Capitol Hill, rebuking his use of a national uh, emergency declaration to build his wall on the border. I mean, this is a president, Anderson, who has built his entire political career on racism and anti-Islamic bigotry. I mean, remember, he rose... Uh, as a political candidate with this crazy birtherism theory about Barack Obama, but he also did it by calling for a complete and total shutdown of all Muslims coming into the United States. He said that Islam hates us. He has done and said a lot of things that are very congruent with the kind of ideology that these white supremacists actually have, which is not to say that it's exactly the same thing, but I think there is enough overlap there that they take inspiration Uh, from his words. I don't think you can blame Donald Trump for this attack. I think you can blame Donald Trump for really trafficking in bigotry and, you know, you know, Islamophobia, wanting to ban all Muslims, as he said during the campaign. However, Donald Trump identifies himself. We all we know for sure is that the white supremacists see him as an ally. So I don't know if you remember in Game of Thrones, somebody says everything that comes before the word but is horse manure, you know? So when they say, I can't blame uh, President Trump for this attack, but, you know, that that means you're blaming President Trump for this attack. And the thing that Trump does that really drives them crazy is that he will not uh, subscribe to their narrative. He's done it again and again. They said to him, uh, is white supremacy, in your view, a rising problem? And he said, not really. Here's his response. I think it's a uh, small group of people that have very, very serious problems. I guess if you look at what happened in New Zealand, perhaps that's a case. I don't know enough about it yet. They're just learning about the person and the people involved. Uh, But it's certainly a terrible thing, terrible thing. So here are two clips of Democrats responding to this. One is Senator Richard Blumenthal. The other is Tim Kaine, almost uh, vice president of the United States. Both of these I just find appalling. But this is their response. It's very important to the left that we see these... the the white supremacists who are in some sense rising where there is a real clash of cultures going on in Europe uh, and there is white supremacy rising. But in in this country, I don't know. I get to see a real rally of these guys uh, that that made a lot of uh, noise, but I'll talk about that in a minute. Let's just first look what the Democrats uh, respond. Play Richard Blumenthal first. A heartbreaking day. And of course, our prayers go out to the people of New Zealand, particularly the loved ones and survivors and victims. But words do have consequences. And we know that at the very pinnacle of power in our own country, 
People are talking about good people on both sides. You mean the president. They're having a hard time calling this out for some reason. I think it's more than the president. It's the people who enable him and who fail to stand up to him and speak out. And we're seeing some glimmers of spine now in the United States Congress. Some of my colleagues in the last three votes standing up to him and saying no to his trampling on the Constitution. But it is also more than words. The president has defied constitutional norms and principles in declaring a national emergency. Words have consequences like saying we have an invasion on our border. Words have consequences. So why don't his words have consequences? What, how, did, how did Trump, I mean, this is a thing that hasn't even been tested in the courts yet. How did Trump, by declaring an emergency according to a law that, this, that Congress made, how is he going against uh, congressional norms and by waiting for the courts to decide what, how that's going to pan out? Here's Tim Kaine uh, talking about this as well. And, and listen to, of course, the repeated theme. It is on the rise, and the president should call it out, but sadly, He's not doing that. We saw in the aftermath of the horrible attack in Charlottesville that he tried to say that the white supremacists, neo-Nazis, neo-Confederates there were just, you know, good people. Um, But when you see church shootings in Charleston, a synagogue shooting in Pittsburgh, you see this hate-filled manifesto uh, of the shooter in New Zealand who is murdering Muslims. We have to confront the fact that there, there is a rise in white supremacy. Uh, anti-immigrant, anti-Muslim uh, attitudes. The president uses language often that's very similar to the language used by these bigots and racists. And if he's not going to call it out, then other leaders have to do more to call it out. And I certainly will. So both of these guys reference what the press has gone worked overtime at making the, uh, a, a mythology about Trump saying that both sides had good people, meaning there were good people among the fascists who invaded Charlottesville. Let's remember what this was about, Charlottesville. There was a local argument about whether a park should be named after Robert E. Lee and a statue of Robert E. Lee should be taken down. It was a local argument. That's a perfectly fair argument. You're a a black guy who pays taxes and you don't want to take your kid to Robert E. Lee Park. You have a side in that. You're a man who's proud of his Southern heritage and thinks uh, Robert E. Lee should still be remembered. You have a side. That's a local debate. These Fascists, uh, white supremacists descended on the town, and these fascist Antifa people who call themselves anti-fascists but descended on the town with clubs ready to start violence. They came together, and there was a clash, and a woman was killed by one of the white supremacists. Trump was uh, asked about this, and he was talking about the clash over the statues. And this is what he said as they were shouting him down. The press was shouting him down because heaven forfend that the president should be heard above the voices of Jim Acosta. Trump said, excuse me, they didn't put themselves down as neo-Nazis and you had some very bad people in that group, but you also had people that were very fine people on both sides. You had people in that group, excuse me, excuse me, I saw the same pictures you did. You had people in that group that were there to protest the taking down of, to them, a very, very important statue and the renaming of a park from Robert E. Lee to another name. And later he said, I'm not talking about the neo-Nazis and the white nationalists. This is Trump's voice. I'm not talking about the neo-Nazis and the white nationalists because they should be condemned totally. But you had many people in that group other than neo-Nazis and white nationalists, okay? And the press has treated them absolutely unfairly, but not as unfairly as they've treated Donald Trump. You can hear what he's saying. It's clear what he's saying. If anybody had any problem with it, understanding it, they could have asked him to clarify it. They never did. I've never seen a person say, by which, by the two sides, which did you mean? In which point he could have said, as I said at the time, and the two people arguing over Robert E. Lee. So let me ask you this. If this shooter, if this shooter did not approve of the policies of Donald Trump, but he approved of him as a symbol of white supremacy. And if the press has manufactured that symbol, if they have gone out of their way to depict him as that symbol, who's to blame? Who the hell is to blame if this is what this guy saw because they have worked and worked and worked to make it seem like it's so, when it obviously, just from reading the transcript, is not. Okay. 
Let's talk about honey. Uh, you know, this is a thing I love. I've talked about it a million times, but I just love it. It just pops up. You, you don't have to uh, do it. It takes about a minute to get it on your computer. You subscribe to it. It doesn't cost you anything. And it just p- works behind the scenes on your computer. So every time you go online, it looks for deals. It looks for bargains. And it lets you know where to go. It's a free browser add-on. And I, go, it, I use it on Amazon. That's where I do most of my shopping. And it pops up. You can get my own books. You can get Another Kingdom. It'll tell you that there are deals on that. It'll uh, it'll tell you where you can get better prices. It really is nice. Honey has saved its 10 million members an average of 28 bucks 61 and 61 cents. Um, Honey members have already saved more than $800 million, all told, which is not bad for something that's completely free and takes just two clicks to install. There's really no reason not to use Honey. Free, easy to install, and it just sits on your computer behind the scenes. It doesn't bug you at all. So shop with confidence. Get Honey for free at joinhoney.com slash Andrew. That's joinhoney.com slash Andrew. Honey is the smart shopping assistant that saves you time and money when you're shopping online. So let's talk about this, whether Trump is right about this um, rise in white supremacy. I think that it's certainly true that there is a rise in in white supremacy. Uh, I think it has to do with the fact of of what's happening in Europe. I mean, there's been this massive, uh, unvetted uh, influx of people who some, many of whom, many of whom are antithetical to Western values, have values that are antithetical to Western values. I mean, this is the thing. So they, so the AP runs a, f- a fact check on this, on Trump. And they start to say, well, the Southern Poverty Law Center says there's been an explosion of hate groups. The Southern Poverty Law, Law Center, you want to learn, a, see a great five-minute video of this. John Stossel has one over at uh, Reason. You can check that out. Uh, talk, the Southern Poverty Law Center is a hate group. They are a hate group dedicated to demonizing anyone who disagrees with them. They've called Ayan Hirsi Ali, a, a, you know, a, a former Muslim who was mutilated, uh, who was chased out of her homeland because of, of people threatening her, of Muslims threatening her. They call her, uh, you know, an anti-Muslim extremist. The Family Research Council, which believes in traditional families marry, they call them a hate group. They are a hate group. So you using them against, about to pr- prove this shows that you've got nothing. You You have got nothing. They keep saying, oh, the FBI, the Justice Department says there's been a rise in hate crimes. And that's true. But guess who? Guess who the rise is against? It's against the Jews. There was a drop, 11 percent drop against Muslims. Uh, You know, and and listen, I don't I don't mean to attack Muslim people. I know there are plenty of great Muslim people. That's not the point. But of the 14 major of four of the top 14 major wars going on in the world right now, of the top 14, 13 of them involve Islam. That's Muslims killing Muslims, Muslims killing Christians, Muslims killing Jews, Muslims killing everybody. So it can't be it can't be our fault. It can't be the fault of all those different people. There is obviously something wrong in the House of Islam. Now I think that's look. There's something wrong in the Catholic Church with all these uh, um, uh, all this child molesting. But there's something wrong in the House of Islam with all this violence and hatred and uh, attempts to dominate societies elsewhere. This is true. And if you can't say that, if you can't talk about that, what do you think happens? Do you think that decreases hate if you don't talk about it? You know, this is a thing that they've been trying to do for years. We're talking about, like, re- uh, restricting information. Back in the 80s, the New York Times, which was then actually still a newspaper, they stopped telling you what color perpetrators were in crimes because they were black. So many of them were black. And they thought that that fed into bigotry. But if you're not telling us that point of information, how can we draw the picture? It's because they don't want us to draw the picture. And so when they're showing us that, you know, they'll come up with lines, I think it's the uh, Anti-Defamation League, which is a left-wing organization, when they come out with things and they'll say, well, 71% of domestic terrorism is white supremacists. Hey, white supremacists are bad people. And I'll, I'll talk about that too. But white supremacists are bad guys. This is a bad philosophy and there's violence. But when you say 71% of terrorism, what percent of terrorism has to be Islamic when is, Islamic people constitute less uh, than 2% of the American population. So, I mean, this is, you know, why twist these statistics to get where you want to go 
if, if people are going to discover that that's not the truth and it makes them all the angrier. You know, i got to say goodbye to Facebook and YouTube, but come to dailywire.com and subscribe. It's only a lousy 10 bucks a month, and for 100 bucks you get the whole year, plus you get the Leftist Tears Tumblr. I'm traveling. I'm going to be speaking uh, today at, uh, oh my gosh, I've forgotten the name of the school. <laughs> St. Franciscan University, Franciscan University outside of Pittsburgh. I'm lucky I know that I'm in Pittsburgh. Uh, So I'm in Pittsburgh, and um, I haven't seen any of Pittsburgh, though I'd like to. Um, But normally, you know, I would have my Leftist Tears Tumblr with me. I don't. If you subscribe, you get to hear all the shows, watch the shows right on the dailywire.com website. And you get to hear Ben's radio show, and you get to ask questions on the mailbag. All your problems will be solved. Come over to dailywire.com, subscribe, and you can watch the show right there. See, I don't need, I don't need a, a guy to shoot people up as a racist to know that racism is wrong or white supremacy is wrong because I have a philosophy. That fo- it's a fairly complete philosophy of life that actually I can refer to because it makes sense. My philosophy makes sense. It's horrible to be a white supremacist if you're a Christian. If you're a Christian like me, you believe all people are children of God, and what matters about them is how they behave and their ideas. Well, that's what matters. They be- behave out of the ideas in their heads, and so that's what matters. When I say that I have problems or questions or concerns about Islam, it's questions about those ideas, because I know what ideas do to people. You know, you start out thinking that men and women should be equal, and you then think, well, in order for them to be equal, you have to abort a baby, and in order for you to abort a baby, even if the baby uh, comes out alive, you have to let it die. Ideas lead you down very, very terrible paths. They lead you into evil. That's what they do. And so I have concerns about some of the tenets of Islam, like its insistence that government has to be... uh, a theocracy, essentially, and the fact that you can't translate the Quran. Those are things, and, and their treatment of women, those are things that I question about. I know that white supremacy is wrong because I believe that all people are children of God and can do good and can contribute and be good people. Why do they think? Why does the left think it's wrong? Why does the left think it's wrong? I mean, we've heard from them, black lives matter, and you should be shouted down if you say all lives matter. So do they believe it's wrong because they're just on the other side? I mean, it's like, it's like gays. You say to me, well, gays should have equal rights. And I say yes. And then you say, oh, and if you don't want to uh, celebrate their wedding, your business should be destroyed. And I go, wait, wait, what? What, what is that? It's, in other words, are you asking for equality or are you asking that power be transferred from one group to another group, that one group had it unfairly, now another group had it unfairly? That seems to me what the left is constantly doing. The left is constantly basically wanting, to, pretending that they want equality, but what they really want is to transfer unfair power from one group and give Give it to another group unfairly as if that's going to somehow balance their guilt problems or the country's guilt problems or whatever it is. I don't know why the left thinks white supremacy is bad, except for the fact that maybe they think only black lives matter. I mean, that's what I think. I, I know it's bad. I know it's bad. I don't need somebody to kill somebody to know it's bad. I know killing people is bad, too, for a lot of the same reasons. I'm wondering what they think, what, why it is. I'd like to have them on and explain it to me, because it seems to me the left's attitude toward race and toward religion is nonsense. They have no problem with Dianne Feinstein hectoring a judge candidate because she's a Catholic, but they do have a problem if I point out uh, some of the problems in the House of Islam. You know, that that is... That is really, really bad news. And, you know, there was this NYU student who attacked Chelsea Clinton. I'm sure you've seen this. This has gone viral. Uh, It's an unbelievable piece of tape where she attacks Chelsea Clinton and says she contributed to the rhetoric that uh, inspired this attack because she joined in condemning Congresswoman Ilhan Omar's anti-Semitism. Listen to this, a little bit of this uh, confrontation. All that you have done and all this homophobia that you have sown. This, this, this right here is the result of a massacre stoked by people like you and the words that you have put out into the world. And I want you to know that and I want you to feel that deep inside. 49 people died because of the rhetoric that you put out there. I don't think... I what don't does think I'm sorry you feel that way mean? What does that mean? Your parents... You know... <laughs> 
We have an epidemic in this country of young people who know absolutely nothing and are absolutely sure of their moral stances. It's not just, you know, Alexandria occasional, occasional cortex. It's not just Congresswoman Ilhan Omar. It's people like this. That woman knows nothing. That guy who was shouting, the people who are snapping their fingers, they're telling Chelsea Clinton that she somehow has a connection to this New Zealand massacre because she def uh, opposed anti-Semitism. Now, when you go and you look at the statistics and you see that I think the rise in anti anti, anti anti-Semitic attacks in America was 37% and Muslim attacks dropped 11%, shouldn't you be rushing your concern to the Jews? I mean, shouldn't you be joining in the uh, attacks on Ilhan Omar and her anti-Semitism? Or shouldn't, if, if you had a philosophy that made sense, if you condemned all uh, uh, racism of any kind, including affirmative action racism, including positive racism, if you, if you condemned as I condemn all treatment of people only according to their race, you, you know, which I just condemn. I think that's wrong. I think if you're a child of God, you're a child of God, you have the same rights uh, as anyone else. I think that's what America is supposed to be about. If, if, you, if you make no sense, that's what you end up doing. This know-nothing woman and her know-nothing friend who are 12 years old and haven't seen anything, haven't experienced anything, don't know anything, are yelling at Chelsea Clinton about a shooting in New Zealand? I mean, it's amazing. This is why I loved Nancy Pelosi has come forward to declare that the voting age should be... <laughs> <laughs> should be 16. Now, I can understand why Democrats would think this. Here's Nancy Pelosi. I myself, personally, I'm not speaking for my caucus, I myself have always been for lowering the, vote, the voting age to 16. I think it's really important to capture kids when they're in high school, when they're interested in all of this, when they're learning about government to be able to vote. That is, that is not necessary. You know, in other words, some of the priorities in this bill are about uh, transparency and openness and accessibility and the rest. Uh, that's a subject of debate, but my view is that uh, I would welcome that. But I've been in that position for a long time. That's what we need is people who know less. We know, as I always say, youth and ignorance are synonyms. We need people who know less to vote. That's, why, why would the Democrats want that? Hmm, that's a chin scratcher. Why, why would Democrats want people who know nothing to be able to vote? It's, it's, it's a tough one to figure out. This is how we get Beto. Beto O'Rourke, I'm watching this guy. I mean, he's, so in the first day, in his first day as a candidate, one of the 700 candidates, uh, Democrat candidates for president, he raises six million bucks, which is more than anybody else, any of the other candidates. And I'm watching this guy, and it's like, I don't, I don't even know what he believes. I don't know what he stands for. He stands for tearing down walls that are there already. He thinks, you know, there shouldn't be any border patrol. I, don't, I do not know what the guy stands for. I, I, his first day out, he goes out there and he's already, he starts out apologizing for being white. Here he is apologizing to Chuck Todd for being white. I, I would never uh, begin by saying I'm at any disadvantage at all. Uh, as a, a white man um, who has had privileges that, that others could not depend on or take for granted, uh, I've clearly had advantages over the, the course of my life. I think recognizing that and understanding that, that others have not, doing everything I can to ensure that there is opportunity and the possibility for advancement and advantage for everyone is a big part of this campaign and a big part of the people who comprise this campaign. I just think that this is the best field um, that we've ever seen in the nominating process. Yeah. Uh, I think the diversity of background and experience, expertise that is going to be brought to bear on these problems is exceptional. And I know at the end of the day, we're all going to be on the same team. And I'm excited about that. <laughs> so he's, he's got, he's freshly apologizes for his privilege. Then a Reuters reporter, I love this, a Reuters reporter reveals that uh, that he belonged to a an influential hacking group calling itself the Cult of the Dead Cow. And he's bragging, the Reuters reporter is bragging uh, that they got, the Reuters is bragging that they got this scoop uh, back in, in late uh, 2017, but they didn't reveal it until the uh, uh, election between O'Rourke and Ted Cruz was over. They sat on the story. So they're protecting this guy. He's a kind of a second-rate Obama politician. You know, they think he's electable, so they just love him. He inspires that you know, passion for human beings, for princes that the, uh, have, so that the left has. So then 
he goes out and he says, makes a joke about how his wife, Amy, raised their three kids sometimes with my help. And oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. The feminists, they went nuts. And so now he has to apologize for that, right? And he says, not only will I not say that again, but I'll be more thoughtful going forward in the way I talk about our marriage and also the way in which I acknowledge the truth of the criticism that I have enjoyed white privilege. I mean, I cannot vomit enough to express how I feel about that comment. I mean, you know, one of the reasons, so help me, this is reason alone to vote for Donald Trump is because he doesn't do this. He doesn't apologize. I mean, if only, I know sometimes he's a bore. I know sometimes he says insensitive things. Even that Charlottesville thing he was saying, it was an insensitive moment because a woman had been killed by white supremacists. He shouldn't have said it maybe in that moment. But just the fact that he doesn't apologize is is so much better than these guys. It's like, it's all eggshells and apologies. Eggshells and apologies. And and it's all f- fake because you have Ilan Omar saying, oh, you know, I, I apologize, but I still say what I said. But I apologize for the way you feel about what I said. I apologize that you feel the way I said, that what I said made you feel something that you shouldn't have felt when I said it because I'm still saying it. It doesn't mean anything. It's all nonsense. And it's just it's just a way of, of placating this outrage mob that is everywhere. And I have to tell you, you know, there was a story, there's a, a, a movie coming out on Netflix uh, called uh, Triple Frontier and Charlie Hunnam, the actor. Is that how you pronounce that? I think that's how you pronounce it, Charlie Hunnam. Uh, the actor went out and he was giving interviews and he said uh, how he liked Jordan Peterson. Uh, he was talking about Jordan Peterson. And, oh, the press was, they, you know, yeah, uh, Twitter and Yahoo News, the celebrity news people, they went after him because evil. And I just love this. They said, they said, um, he went after he went after uh, Jordan Peterson because uh, Peterson didn't want the university where he was a professor to ad- to adopt the use of gender neutral pronouns. I mean, this is this is the problems that we we have in this country. Meanwhile, President Trump went after Saturday Night Live, and he said, and they they've accused him of threatening to have a um, an investiga- federal investigation of Saturday Night Live. This is what he said. All right, Trump said. It's truly incredible that shows like Saturday Night Live, not funny, no talent, can spend all of their time knocking the same person, me, over and over without so much of a mention of the other side, like an advertisement without consequences. Same with late night shows. He was reacting to an old show they were playing. It was a rerun. Should the Federal Election Commission and or FCC look into this? There must be collusion with the Democrats and, of course, Russia. Such one-sided media coverage, most of it fake news. Hard to believe I won and am winning. I mean, obviously clowning around, and this became a big deal. Always oh, threatening to censor to investigate Saturday Night Live. It's unbelievable. I have, to, I have to close with just a funny story. I'm going to teach at Hillsdale for a couple weeks at the end of the month, uh, at the beginning of next month. And I'm teaching a class in in culture and how to cover the culture as a journalist. This is for their journalism department. And I wanted to talk about the way that superhero movies have become a bone of contention. Now, people argue politically over superhero movies. And I was thinking, when did this begin? And I thought, oh, yeah, it began with me. It began when I wrote a a piece for the Wall Street Journal about uh, The Dark Knight and how The Dark Knight was a tribute to George W. Bush, which quite obviously, now looking back, quite obviously was. And it started a firestorm. But of course, I was paying attention to it in the sense that uh, I was getting a lot of emails about it, and it was uh, helping to sell my book, Empire of Lies, which I was happy about. But I wasn't paying attention to what the left was saying about me, because I never do. So as prepare, I'm preparing this class, and I'm thinking, I, I ought to get some examples of how the left reacted to this, uh, so I can just talk about it. And I came upon this clip of Keith Olbermann. I do not know if people actually remember Keith Olbermann. He was this dopey sports writer who became a dopey, absurd political commentator. And here he is attacking me. This is back, when, when was that? 2008. Uh, here he is attacking me. I've never seen this before. And um, I, I just love this. This is Keith Olbermann attacking me for saying that Batman and George Bush were related. The first time for Countdown's worst persons in the world, the bronze to Rupert Murdoch, who actually had this printed in his Wall Street Journal today. Uh, this is the review of the new Batman film, The Dark Knight, by a conservative mystery writer. Joseph Clavin wrote this, but I'll read it as Murdoch because, well, because I want to. There seems to be no, no question that the Batman film, The Dark Knight, currently breaking every box office record in history, are. 
<laughs> so, so not only does he get my, my name wrong, but he won't even, he, he calls Rupert Murdoch the worst person in, in the world instead of me. He was as if Rupert Murdoch had anything to do with it. I mean, I, he, I didn't deal with Rupert Murdoch. He didn't inspire the article. But the only thing that got me about this is the night that this happened, John Nolte came over my house for dinner and he walked in with this worried look on his face and he said, how does it feel to be attacked so savagely? And I said, am I? Am I being attacked? And I was absolutely, I was absolutely honest. I had no idea that the left was going after me at this degree. And as I saw this, I thought, you know, it's probably something about me that here it is 11 years later, and I've never seen any of these things. I never, like when Nolte left, I didn't then go to run to my computer to see what they were saying, because I so much, I have so little respect for these people. I have so little respect for people who could see an actual tragedy or an actual atrocity take place. Uh, you know, uh, in, the, in, in the antipodes around the world and blame it on the president of the United States and that they call themselves mainstream newsmen. That's corruption. That's intellectual corruption, philosophical corruption. And I don't think any of us, I think Trump is right about this. None of us should give a rat's what they say about us or what they say about the news because that really is a despicable, it's a level of corruption so deep that it's become despicable. All right, I'll still be here in Pittsburgh tomorrow. I'm speaking tonight at Franciscan University. Uh, It should be entertaining, I hope. And uh, I will see you again tomorrow. I'm Andrew Claven. This is The Andrew Claven Show. The Andrew Claven Show is produced by Robert Sterling. Executive producer, Jeremy Boring. Senior producer, Jonathan Hay. Our supervising producer is Mathis Glover. And our technical producer is Austin Stevens. Edited by Adam Saievitz. Audio is mixed by Mike Cormina. Hair and makeup is by Jesua Alvera. And our animations are by Cynthia Angul. Production assistant, Nick Sheehan. The Andrew Claven Show is a Daily Wire production. Copyright Daily Wire 2019. I'm Michael Knowles, host of The Michael Knowles Show. A killer goes on...